Welcome to this one hour lecture on international psychology. This lecture will be presented by myself, Mark Yang, as well as my colleague Liu Yuting from Taiwan. We will begin with an introduction of the presenters. My name is Mark Yang, and I'm an adjunct professor at Saybrook. I'm currently based in Taiwan, where I see clients on a weekly basis, as well as participate in the development of humanistic and existential psychology training programs throughout Asia. Prior to my arrival in Taiwan, I was the director of clinical training for Alliant International University's PsyD program in Hong Kong. AIU is a parent company of the California School of Professional Psychology. CSPP. As a DCT, I was responsible for setting up training sites as well as supervising the supervisors who provided clinical supervision to the, to the Hong Kong students. I also conducted individual and group supervision myself. The cases that I will be discussing with you today came out of my administrative and supervisory experiences during my tenure in Hong Kong. Hello everyone, my name is Yutin Lu. I'm currently work as multicultural counselor in Mandarin Training Center at NTNU in Taiwan. And basically my job is in charge of student counseling and consultation affairs and also I'm doing international volunteer recruit. So I'm glad to be here with you guys. The format for our lecture will consist of case presentations followed by discussion questions. I will insert a series of pauses at the end of each section of the cases, as well as the proposed discussion questions, so you can pause this podcast at any of these points to review the details of the case and carry out a discussion regarding the case and the proposed discussion questions. I will be presenting my thoughts about each case from a Western perspective, given my Western upbringing and education while Yuting will be offering her thoughts and reflections from an Asian perspective. Given my background as a clinician, the materials presented will be more biased towards a clinical perspective. However, instead of focusing just on the clinical elements, Yuting and I will highlight the cultural and societal elements that is essential to the background of each of the two cases. I believe these discussions will be a benefit to those of you uh, view, those of your students and audience who are not clinicians by training. Once again, I will be drawing upon my experience as a supervisor, instructor, and administrator in Hong Kong, while Yu Ting will draw from her clinical and administrative experiences in Taiwan. Let's move on to the first case. Case 1, Section A. An 11-year-old boy is referred to an intern training at a local services agency that is working with at-risk youth. The intern suspects that the boy has been physically abused. The intern has met with the boy once. The boy has failed to appear for subsequent sessions. During the session, the boy shared that his step stepmother from China would use a clothes hanger to hit him as a form of discipline. The intern has also found out from phone, from phone conversations subsequent to the first session that one of the reasons the boy has not attended the session is that his father did not give him money for transportation. The boy reports that the father will not give him any more pocket money because of this overspending. The boy also reports that his parents do not think that physical punishment as a form of discipline is anything as serious as child abuse. The intern suspects that the boy's stepmother has overstayed her visa or permit in, um, and this is in this thus reluctant to have contact with the social service agency. Here are some discussion questions. One, how would you handle this case at this point? What are your concerns? Two, what are some of the cultural elements of this case? Going on further in the case, section B, the client discusses air, this case with his clinical supervisor who was trained from the United States. The clinical supervisor encouraged the client to report the case to the government social service agency. However, the agency director understood that hitting a child with a hanger was common practice in terms of child discipline and asked the intern not to report. Whose advice should the intern follow? 
the agency director or clinical supervisor? What will you do as a director of clinical training? Do you back up your clinical supervisor and or confront the agency director? Discussion questions. What is your reaction as you read about this case? How would you advise the student? And one last question. Who makes up the laws? Who makes up the ethical codes? Given that the US is a litigious society, we've all been trained as to our legal mandates when it comes to the practice of psychology. And in this case, if I were practicing in the US, I would immediately be concerned about the legal mandate to report a case of suspected child abuse. You will run the risk of losing your hard-earned licenses if you fail to report suspected abuse in a timely manner. However, if I'm practicing in a society, what if I'm practicing in a society where there are no licensure requirements nor legal reporting mandates for psychologists? This is the case in Hong Kong. Consider that in Hong Kong, there are no Tarasov types of legal mandate for reporting. Can you imagine? Tar Tarasov is something that clinicians take for granted in the United States. However, there's no such legal mandate in Hong Kong, nor much of Asia. Of course, Asian clinicians may still choose to break confidentiality in Tarasov type of situations, but they would do so because of an ethical or moral standard rather than a legal mandate. The decision to report becomes much more ambiguous without the legal mandate. For non-clinicians in the audience, a Tarasov case is when a client discloses to his or her therapist of his or her intent to commit Im imminent harm to an identifiable victim. The clinician becomes at that point legally obligated to break confidentiality and report the case to relevant authorities in the US. In Hong Kong, the mental field is dominated by social workers. Social workers are recognized by the government and registration or licensure is required in order to practice as a social worker in Hong Kong. However, there are less than 1,000 psychologists registered in Hong Kong in the Hong Kong Psychological Society. There are simply not enough psychologists to warrant government oversight. So we return to the basic question what will you do if there's no legal mandate nor protection if you choose to break confidentiality and report this case, uh, sus this suspected case of child abuse? On what ground will you choose to report if you decide to risk breaking confidentiality? The decision is not as clear cut as I would if it were in the US. So when I've conducted supervision focusing on legal and ethical issues, I've often ch I'm often challenging the students to think through why they would do what they do. With no legal mandate to report, how will you make your decision whether and when to report confidentiality? After all, you're not legally obligated to break confidentiality in the US, in, in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, given that there's no legal mandate to report, the clinician will have to carry more of the responsibility for the decision of whether or not to break confidentiality to report a suspected case of child abuse. In the U.S., the government or society has decided to take on that responsibility by requiring psychologists to be mandated reporters. In Hong Kong, psychologists are left to ponder that decision with only the general, aspirational, and non-specific guidance of ethical codes of the Hong Kong Psychological Society, along with what is to be considered the standard practice of his or her colleagues. Given the limited size and development of the field of psychology, psychologists are left with more individual responsibilities to ponder when it comes to the decision of whether to break confidentiality on a case of suspected child abuse. Instead of a relatively legal mandate, a psychologist choosing to break confidentiality in order to protect the youth must do so based upon ethical or moral codes, which are much more ambiguous and offer less legal protection.
So when one begins to consider the practice of psychology from an international perspective, one will immediately begin to think and reflect more deeply about legal, ethical, and moral standards of practice. The differences in each of these areas may significantly impact the hows and whys of your practice. Consider the legal arena. In Asia, most people mistakenly believe that it is the professional associations, such as APA, which grants one the authority to practice. They think the professional association is the authority. Therefore, they all want to follow APA standards when it comes to training and licensure. I have little success explaining to them that APA is just a professional body without the legal authority to grant licenses or enforce training standards. Indeed, the field of psychology has matured to the point in the U.S. where it is of sufficient concern to the society at large, since that the government has set up boards to require and monitor the licensure and registration of psychologists. We all know those boards well, don't we? These boards are set up in order to protect the welfare of the public and are less po politically biased compared to how things are run here in Asia. In Hong Kong, there are no such protections of the public when it comes to the practice of psychology. As I mentioned earlier, there are no licensure requirements for psychologists in Hong Kong. This means that anyone can claim to be a psychologist, rent an office, and begin to collect fees for, for providing psychological services. The Hong Kong Psychological Society attempts to try to impose a professional registration process. The member registration is entirely voluntary. It only has the limited authority to withdraw the membership of its members, but it cannot stop them from practicing psychology. They have limited powers. The field of psychology is simply too small and too new to warrant the government's attention. Hong Kong Psychological Society have been trying to set up a statutory registration for the past 20 years with little success. Again, the government comes back and tells them, you're too small a force for us to invest the energy and resources to set up any kind of licensure or registration process. There are vast differences when it comes to developmental level of this professional bodies between the U.S. and Hong Kong. For example, APA was formed and was founded in 1892 and currently boasts a membership of over 134,000. Hong Kong Psychological Society was founded in 1968 and boasts a current membership of just over 1,000. In regards to disciplinary action, Hong Kong Psychological Society recently just concluded their first case of disciplinary action in the history of the organization. The case involved the member practicing outside his or her area of confidence, of competence, which I have observed to be quite a frequent practice here in Asia. The member misrepresented his or her professional qualifications and practiced false advertising. The, per the pers a prosecution of this case nearly drained the coffers of the society in Hong Kong. The offender's membership was eventually revoked, and of course the member threatened to sue the society. The president of the society, the Hong Kong Psychological Society, shared that the entire disciplinary process was extremely exhausting, but significant for it signaled a developmental milestone of the society as a whole. The amazing reality of the situation is that the member is still continuing to practice psychology for Hong Kong Psychological Society lacks the legal authority to prevent him from continuing his practice. In contrast, the most recent public posting from the disciplinary arm of the Board of Psychology in California show 19 members with the last name, with only the last name beginning with A, who experienced some form of disciplinary actions. All that to say that in the US, disciplinary actions are much more commonplace and the field of psychology is much more further developed in the United States. So I bring up these legal and ethical differences to highlight the fact and in regards to, case, to the case presented earlier, 
even though the clinician's eventual decision may be the same, for example, to break confidentiality and report the case of child abuse, the reasons and possible consequences for the clinicians will be very different. The clinician in Hong Kong will have to will have chosen to break confidentiality for legal or moral reasons, for there will not have been the legal mandate or protection to break confidentiality. And as to the adherence to the ethical codes, that would be entirely voluntary with little possible consequence for failure to abide by the ill-defined code. Before the decision as to whether to report or not, the clinician will need to consider whether the presented case can be considered child abuse. To many of us from the U.S., this is a relatively clear case of child abuse. The U.S. trained supervisor advises the trainee to, pr to report the case to the local government social service agency. Many of us in the U.S. will not think twice about determining that hitting a child with a clothes hanger constitutes child abuse. However, this was common practice in Hong Kong, and the agency director chose not to report. How could this be? What cultural elements are at play here? So Yu Ting now will discuss the case with you from an Asian perspective. In this section, uh, we will, I'm, t I'm going to talk about the parent-children relationship with CU students here. Um, Parent-children parent relationship is a very, very interesting topic in Taiwan. And then, and then I can give you many examples about why, in this case, why um, a lot of counselors, when they deal with children abuse cases, they are struggling whether they should report or not. Because in Taiwan, when the children are raised, they usually will look up their parents. They will look up their parents and see them as the you know example, the good example. So, or and they are very passive, to receiving all the suggestion from the parents. So all the parents, you know, their love and their uh, preach, or even they're using the hammer to do the you know, punishment. They, the, the children, when you ask the Taiwanese, when you ask the Taiwanese children, they always will tell you about, well, as long as they are not, you know, put me in the desk, otherwise I will take that as the affection from the parents. So, you know, even there is the old saying, you know, when the teachers or when the parents, they hit, they use the stick to hit the, the children's the butt or the hands. They usually they think the harder they put, you know, uh, the most they show their more care, they show their love on these children or on these students. So this belief has been, you know, has been passed many generations. So it's not easy to be changed in nowadays. So even right now, the the parents when they take the students to when they take their children to the school, they usually will tell the teacher, you know, don't worry, you know, save your concern. You can do, you know, when when my children is not misbehavior, you try to, you know, punish him as much as you can. I just want you to correct his misbehavior, or if he have done something wrong, just pe preach him or preach her and tell him, or maybe just call me because I want you to, you know, grow up to be, you know, righteous guy or righteous no matter no matter what kind of means you can do, just make sure he's not doing something bad. But deep inside they are not thinking about they probably the parents or probably the teachers they are thinking about maybe the punishment is not the only way to educate the children in Taiwanese society. Uh, I have to say we we have changed this, you know, uh source for a couple of years. Now the teachers hesitate to punish the, the the student, but most of the teachers they still have to hold this thought. They have to punish student, otherwise they cannot change their behavior. And also, teach students will think about you know punishment. Also, it's the basic way and quick way for the parents and teachers to to correct my behavior. So I should follow. And then 
speak of punishment, speak of the why you may stop, why they so you know receive the punishment because, like I said earlier, uh, we have to, you know, re educate by the Confucius thought. So there is the old saying like you know, 父子子孝啊，兄友弟恭啊，尊敬师长 So this Chinese phrase I just spoke is means, you know, we have to respect our you know, older authority figure like teachers and parents. So whenever they do, we have to respect every every behavior that shows on you must come with the reason. And that reason means they care about you and it comes from the love. So that's why children they usually that's why when the constant means the children abuse and children uh, and they think less abuse when when the parents use the hammer or maybe use a knife to threaten their kids. Why the counselor they also always hesitate to report because they have to think about sometimes they will think about the children may be they hesitate. They don't want their parents to be reported. Because once their children be reported, they are going to have a fear of losing their parents. They are not going to see their parents again. So they rather, you know, just, you know, deal with you know, the parents threaten them sometimes instead of losing their parents forever. So that's why that's the, some one difficulty the counselor when they see the children abuse they they have to think about whether she report or not. And here uh, if I'm going to be deal with these certain kind of cases, if I if I notice a suspect that the parents really straighten the life of these children, I definitely have to report that. However, I also will think about what if I report if I'm going to put these children into the dangers of not losing their his parents here. So I have to also consult with the social work institute and see if there's another way. Uh, maybe maybe have maybe you know put maybe just have these parents receiving maybe certain hours amount of, you know, education, training or literature and helping them understanding that, you know, parenting may be need to correct it or justify to the other way instead of, you know, using the punishment. That might be another solution I can do. Or sometimes I have to report to the social worker because usually when the helping professional they not they suspect there is a family they you know have been through in the children abuse or maybe some people neighbor who report said one family have the children abuse cases. Usually we already have a record already. So since this already put in the record, a social worker have to check with this family once a while and see how is, you know, the situation get worse or get better. Yeah, if it get better and that's really good, but if it get worse, then definitely sometimes have to push through the court and see who the parents or grandfa grandfather or grandparents have to, you know, strive for the custody. So that would be another problem has to go through, because but if if the cases have to be walked that far, have to walk with the custody, then the children here we have to follow up with children for many years until he is 18, and see how it's been educated, how it's been trained by you know the other adopt adopt parents or grandparents, and see how it's going well. So Asia. Asia parenting relationship, I have to say, is a fundamental about, um, I have to say, the fundamental problem every counselor will meet when they deal with the children abuse, especially when they talk with them, you know, trying to take intake form when you talk to them. Even you want to drive, even, even though you want to uh, initiate a counseling with the children, we initiate with the parents, that's the difficult part to do that because not every parent is uh, not willing to do that. Like I say, they have the faith, they have dignity, they don't want to you know, put their uh, weakness or maybe this once the, they will think about once this case is reported, uh, reporting every news will know about his abuse, his children and they will lose their faith. So they don't want you to report that. And at the same time, they will, they will challenge you you know, they will challenge your counselor like you would never 
understand or know my children better than me. And they will think because the children, I have these children for like 10 months. I, I raised these children. I know what's the best way to, to raise these children, educate these children. So now you are going to taking these children away from me. So how are you going to raise these children? They will challenge you. So sometimes if the if the counselor can well prepare, they can talk about the other welfare, you know, security institute, and then can build up, you know, the follow up, the environment for this um, children for like education, financial statement, everything to make sure. Then definitely he can, the counselor can, you know, can work out with the parents, or maybe can put into the curve. But if the counselor not think about that far, then I would suggest you not not trying to, you know, take away these children away from the parents because that will put the children like a, you know, more harm. Yeah. Because when he sees when the children sees the parents, you know, use the hammer to him they already already harm them already. But if you take them away from them, that kinda make them feel conflict with the image about the parents' love. Because they will think about, they, because the children will think about, my parents have been doing me so well, so good for many couple years, and all of a sudden, they have been taken away from me because I have done something, that my, I have might be do something bad. That's why the parents will use the hand, and they are so angry. So maybe they have four, but I have taken responsibility too. So children will think that way. So they probably were unhappy with you. So you don't don't even mention you want to, you know, counsel with these children. So that's very that's a very difficult part. So as a Taiwanese counselor, when we when we trying to counsel with the client, sometimes it's not easy just counsel with one individual client. Sometimes you have to think about the family systems, social security system, and financial system, and see and also. Counselor session not just just one counselor's job. Sometimes I have to consult many helping professionals, like social worker, nurse, or maybe doctor, or maybe a curb, curb, a lawyer, and see what's the best, interesting for these children. After you make a decision, before you make a decision. Now let's consider another supervision case I encountered in Hong Kong, where different cultural values played a significant role on how I chose to handle this case. Case two, section A. An intern is doing her internship at a child care center. About six months into this internship, the intern was assigned to work with the family of a child. After seeing the family for two sessions, the agency director informed the intern that an administrator from the head office wants a report from the intern regarding her work at the center. The report is to contain details of her clinical observations, her conceptualization of the family issues, and the client's presenting problem along with details of any treatment that she has given to the family. Student discussion questions. Why do you think the administrator wants to report? How do you think the administrator and or the agency views the intern? What are the legal and ethical concerns here? Hong Kong follows a British model of psychology training and practice. The minimum educational requirements for clinical psychologists in Hong Kong is a master's degree. I've heard that the UK changed their minimum requirements now to a doctoral degree. The clinical psychology training programs are extremely competitive. Prior to the arrival of the AIU PsyD program to Hong Kong, there were only two master's programs training clinical psychologists in Hong Kong. Between the two programs, there are 20 slots available every year, and they typically receive over 200 applicants for these 20 slots. Given such levels of competition, the graduates are vulnerable to a sense of prestige, superiority, and entitlement, while viewing themselves as the cream of the crop. Thus, the reputation of clinical psychologists in Hong Kong is that they are known for being aloof, non-cooperative, with an elitist mentality. My guess is that this is partially true. On the other hand, when it comes to clinical practice, as demonstrated with this case, psychology training and mentality do differ 
from that of social workers. So some of these perceptions may be the result of different standards of practice. For example, confidentiality and case conceptualizations are handled quite differently between these two disciplines. Given the current ethos surrounding clinical psychologists in Hong Kong, trainees are typically imbued with much more responsibility, authority, and sense of competence than they, than they deserve. The training agencies typically very much welcome trainees for they view tr the trainees as highly qualified additional resources in an otherwise, an otherwise under-resourced NGO. Many of these agency directors are overworked themselves. This training really becomes a double-edged sword for the trainees, for the trainees are definitely thrown into the deep end of the pool, as in this case example. At the same time, given the reality of the situation, the trainees have the chance to develop more quickly as a result of the increased expectations. Overall, what I had to deal with as DCT is that the, overwhel the overwhelming majority of the training sites do not have a training mentality for they themselves did not graduate from a program that provided such levels of training and support for their students. So this is the background behind the inappropriate request for our trainee to offer her expert opinion on the case she was seeing. The legal and ethical concern here is one of confidentiality. Even though the head administrator is part of the agency, does she have the right or need to know about the case? After all, she's not part of the treatment team. Did this constitute an intrusion in the family's privacy? Let's go on now to the second section of the case. Case 2, Section B. The administrator from the head office does not have a mental health background, whereas the agency director has a background in social work. The agency director has limited understanding of the need for confidentiality, but she knows enough to sense that this is an invasion of the family's privacy. She, feel, she feels caught between what she senses is an ethical violation, but is also wary under an administrator's request. She decided to ask the intern to choose to show some of the progress notes to the administrator from the head office. student discussion questions. How would you advise the intern in this case then? What are the cultural elements at work here? And how does ethics apply in this cross-cultural case? Just as the agency director was faced with a difficult choice, the trainee and consequently her clinical supervisors were also faced with a difficult choice. Do I obey and agree to the request to release the information or do I insist upon the rights to privacy of the child's family? This is truly a difficult choice for there are a number of strong cultural elements of practice here. Indeed, how do ethics and standards of practice apply in this cross-cultural setting? The question that the clinical supervisors and I often were confronted with were, should we follow a U.S. standard of practice and risk alienating the hard-won trust of the local training agency? After all, this is their home turf and we are their guests. Even though, unlike U.S. training sites, these training sites did not have to provide the on-site su clinical supervision, but they did not have qualified supervisors at nearly all of the NGO sites that we worked with did not employ a clinical psychologist on staff. So a related question is, should we apply U.S. standards of training requirements to the local setting? To put it simply, should we rock the boat? On the other hand, do we have the responsibility to improve upon the local standards of practice? Can we do this with humility? These are difficult questions to struggle with. Now, Yuting will tell you some about her perspective upon this case and also the earlier case in respect to um, local practices, collectivism, hierarchy, and economic considerations. Uh, 
from Taiwanese point of view uh, regard to these cases. Uh, there are some few points I would like to point out when you know at work as a Taiwanese counselor. Usually when we deal with this kind certain kind of cases, we first of all we mm, the three obstacles we will meet is we have to think about the social harmonies. Um, I'm not so sure how many uh, students you understand what this uh, social harmony will mean, so I'll give you some example. For example, like uh, when a Taiwanese counselor or a worker, any worker they would like to work in a social community or a working field, um, they have to be try to figure out what would be the harmony would be if anything any actor that will be doing will harm any individual in this community or social fields, they have to be highly aware of anything they would do will do some harm to maybe to the director or maybe to the client or maybe may the client's uh, parent feel shame of themselves. So they have to be very highly cautious now mm, before they doing any action they have to be highly aware of. Uh, the second point they have to look at is called the mian zi. The mian zi literally in uh, translation is called the face. Uh, that means like when you doing something uh, harm or, or doing something will make you feel shame of yourself, then basically they will really not to do so because that will make you lose your dignity in front of others. So in this case, uh, when counselor doing these kind of cases, when they realize if they report these cases or if they doing some action will make the client's parents or make their um, director or even the intern's director feel shame about themselves not doing the righteous things, then they maybe maybe report it basically maybe report itself is a good thing though. However, um, they have to be also have to rethink about whether they should do report immediately or not because they don't want um, the director or make the children's parents feel shame about themselves. So they have to um, think about from this point of view. And third point we have to look at is called the Xiao Shun. Xiao Shun basically from the Confucius source. Confucius is more like a Western, it's more like the Chinese philosopher. Uh, we were born, most of the Taiwanese children, they were educated from Confucius thought. Uh, the um, briefly explain to you guys is every children is supposed to respect the high, higher authority figure. Uh, also have to respect, the authority figure means like parents and teachers or maybe uh, your employer, your, your boss. So for the children, they basically will think about um, maybe what my state mother do for me, did for me as a henner, maybe just trying to show their affection to me, not really trying to straighten my life. So the children may feel confused whether he should report it or maybe he should follow the counseling you know, direction and then you know receive the counseling session. And also from the counselor side, maybe he, maybe the counselor, uh, intern counselor maybe will hesitate to report as the clinical advisor advice suggestion. Maybe he will think about, mm, I have to respect my uh, side director's advice. Maybe it's better not to report because it's the common practice way in Taiwan. So that's basically three point of view as the Taiwanese counselor have to look at when they deal with these kind of cases. And also, uh, hierarchy, hierarchy is very important in Taiwan though. Like I stated previously a uh, couple of minutes ago, respectful authority is very important in Taiwan. So everything, every decision we are going to make, usually we'll consult with the director or teachers or maybe other, mm, maybe even principal to to have the you know the agreement to see whether this decision is going to met is right or not, and also we look up the economic considerations. Uh, here we talk about the economic considerations means um, when the intern in Taiwan work as intern in Taiwan, that means they are not get paid. 
that means they have to work earn the hours to graduate or maybe have to earn some hours so qualify to take the counseling examinations so when they are doing things they will think about whether they where they are going to do uh, will jeopardize they receiving these credits from their director so that means uh, if they are not really um, compromise or not really follow direction director's suggestion maybe they will lose their job maybe they cannot graduate smoothly and also we talk about the need to wear multiple hats um, that means when they are working as an intern, sometimes there were so many, they will receive different kind of conflict suggestion. So um, they cannot really, you know, they cannot really to do whatever they think is the right thing to do. They usually have to consult uh, the director or bosses. And in this case, he, uh, this intern has a two director. So the intern collector, uh, the clinical collector suggests him have to report. However, at the same time, the, the, the side director tells them not to report. So he will conflict with two uh, work assets. So that's really hard for the intern to do because both of the director also are authority figure to him. So in this case, for an intern, it's not easy to deal with. So that's a basically a uh, very point of view when you when the Taiwanese interns you deal with these cases. They have to be higher cautious and higher aware of what the other aspects they have to look at. So just a point of clarification, the Xiao Sun has to do with filial piety in terms of obeying authority. So is it true to say then, uh, Yu Ting, that, that here on one hand, you have professional ethics that um, guide what one should do. But at the same time, you also have all these different um, other considerations in terms of social harmony, mianzi, xiao sun, and hierarchy. So what, how does one balance you know, what to follow, uh, these set of professional ethics and guidelines, or these very powerful social forces that are also at work? How does one reconcile these two, conf you know, sometimes conflicting uh, forces that 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 um, guide what you should do? How do you try to make sense of that in your own work? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really that's a really tough question and then tough question for me to answer though because it depends. Like, um, indeed, actually, there is a guideline, the you know, working as a guideline to to guide the helping professional as a counselor to follow with, like they are not allowed to, they, if they see the abused children, they definitely have a report. If they are not report within the 24 hours, they definitely will give fine. All the helping professional knows about this ethic. However, in Taiwan, we, we tend to, you know, maintain the social harmony. For example, um, we see about you know family is a you know the family as a whole has to be have father and parents and children in there and that's called a good family. So what if I'm going to report and this children's mom is going to take it away from this children, and then probably the the counselor will hesitate to report. Maybe he has to consult with the you know, you know, maintain the family harmony, so he probably will rethink about that, well, probably not just, you know, report it. And also, um, when you deal with the cases, it depends on like, where you work. If you work in like helping professional uh, center, counseling center, and then all your colleagues, your director, they are all educated from, they also have the, you know, counseling training experiences. So definitely they can give you, you know, the better idea of uh, how to deal with this counseling session. However, in Taiwan, we don't really, not every counselor can work as a student counseling center. Sometimes they work as the business company. Sometimes they work like at the middle school. And in the middle school or junior high school or senior high school, they don't really have the, you know, the student counseling center. They just have the counselor 
teacher. Then counselor teacher usually just work with the you know the teacher, like English teacher and history teacher. So when you trying to deal with these cases, then all you can consult with, you know, when you have the problem, when you, all you can consult with is from different kind of background, training teachers. So not every, not every. Uh, given suggestion is really appropriate for these cases, so it's kind of say to it's kind of uh, you know sad to say that not all the counselor they really can you know um, do the deal with the cases very smoothly. Sometimes really have to um, sometimes really have to uh, maintain the harmony. Like school harmony, maybe the family harmony. They have to think about many and they try to console many, many teachers, or maybe the institute founder, or maybe the principal, or maybe the parents, and try to um, cons uh, compromise and try to find out the better way for each of the you know the teachers and his clients, not just for the clients' own good. So that's the best. The the sad heart difficult part to do this. Um. It sounds like to me that in, in the U.S. what we would have is considerations more on the individual level to protect the rights of the individual. But as I hear you talk, it sounds like the, the counselor here has to con concern himself with more of a, not just the family, not just the, the individual client, not just child, but kind of the whole context of the society and all the multiple factors that uh, the, the, a therapist or a counselor or trainee would have to contend with, it just sounds like much more complex than a typical practice in the, in the U.S. Would you say that's true given your experience? Okay, why don't we move on to the, the next section here and then we'll um, continue on. Let's move on to this final section of the second case, case two, section C. Furthermore, this episode has caused the intern to reflect upon the issue of confidentiality and the security of the treatment records. Currently, her clinical files are filed in a separate location under lock and key, away from the rest of the children's records. Even this practice of keeping extra records requires required negotiation and additional staff training. However, from previous experience as a school social worker, she knows that at a moment of crisis or when the school personnel is having serious struggles with a child's unruly behavior, they will often seek all forms of information and fears that the security of her records may be compromised. This common practice um, is not all that frowned upon. She has conducted some assessments and written some reports based upon that assessment. She also knows that the files contain testing materials, including answer sheets, with raw data that are not easily interpretable to people without training. And last but not least, the intern's training rotation will end in six weeks, and she's unsure if another trainee will follow her to this child care center. She fears for the security of the records after her departure. What should the intern do in regards to records retention and security? student discussion questions. Might we run into the same problem in the U.S.? How would U.S. agencies handle this? How would you handle this problem knowing that no matter what, how much training you conduct, the security of the records and client confidentiality will still not be respected? What sort of policy or practice might you set up? My experience in the various places I've trained and worked at is that record security is something that I never really had to think about. Now that I've taught and practiced in Asia, I realize that this, that it's a sign of the development in the field of psychology in the U.S. and that I've always taken record security for granted in the U.S. I realize that the, the support staff all have had some sort of training and that the basic respect for confidentiality is something that is not part of human nature and normal behavior. 
that it requires training and is part of what it means to be a professional. These things I took for granted in the U.S. I also realized that confidentiality and the basic right to privacy is perhaps one of the better parts of a more litigious society and that those rights are protected by law. Having practiced and engaged in training out here in Asia, I realized that there are varying degrees of privacy for what I've taken for granted in the U.S. For many of the training sites, there were simply no secure place for records to be kept. And one needed to create, and one um, in these training sites needed to be created through negotiation. Or these record storage sites needed to be created through negotiation. Part of that creation meant limiting the access to the records to only people who needed to know. This is a big challenge in many of the places that we place students. For example, one of the better places in terms of records security was a training site set up at a common at a community med medical clinic. The medical clinic had a very good record storage system that was designed more for easy retrieval than security. Nevertheless, they set up um, the setup they had already had was much better than what we had what we experienced and what we saw in most of the other training places. Nevertheless, we still had to negotiate with the doctors and nurses to keep our records in separate locations in order to protect the client's privacy. We did not want nurses, administrative staff, or even the doctors to view the records without the client's consent. This would have, this would have been a basic agreement of understanding in the U.S. However, it took a lot of negotiations and education to finally create such a secure place in that medical clinic. Now, Yutin will talk to you about some local. Okay, on uh, this session, we are talking about uh, confidentiality and record security. So, from the Taiwanese point of view, um, I'm taking myself as an example here. Actually, uh, confidentiality, this term, is very new to the Taiwanese people. Uh, not, I have to admit that everybody in here have a very clear concept, concept of the confidentiality. So, so when we, when working as a counselor here, every time I have to have a conflict with you know dealing to explain what's the confidentiality to the teachers or to the parents or to the school principal, what is confidentiality is about? Because when I deal with the um, uh, children's cases or student cases, normally uh, most of the time teachers they are very concerned about how their uh, students perform in class, especially in Taiwan. Taiwan society is more like an academic approach, environment. So when they, when the teachers feel like uh, the student in their class, how their performance is kind of not really, you know, performance very well, and their grades kind of a little bit unsatisfied thing, they usually will send the student to the counseling center and to, to have them to talk to counseling counselor about what the problem is and so so because of that so teacher usually were curious about how the counseling se counseling session goes so they want to know what's the problem uh, have you know stop their student studying in class or maybe affect their grades falling down so when I miss this you know when I miss this request from the teachers I always have the you know difficulties to explain to them because I can feel how they concern about their student, but at the same time, I have to keep this confidentiality as the helping professional. Because here in Taiwan, if you are not keep the privacy of confidentiality, usually you still will get fined too. And then also we also also violate my working ethic because when I every student I talk to them, I also have them to sign the confidentiality. Uh, agreement. So I already give them my promise. I'm not going to reveal their um, their privacy. So when teacher question me, I have to explain to them. Well, this student really have the issue to deal with, but because of confidentiality, I cannot tell you. So every time I have to meet a lot of you know a lot of teacher, they are not satisfied with me. They will say, What if my student? still not perform as well in my class. Are you going to be responsible for that? Uh, if the, this student have something happen to them, are you going to be responsible to them? So I have to explain to 
these teachers unless uh, except except that they have to they have to show they have doing some harm to themselves or if they have intention of being you know doing suicide other than that I am allowed to to talk their you know counseling session to them so some of the teachers they can understand that but now most of the, the teachers will understand that they will they will feel like uh, they they will feel like they have to know maybe it because maybe because it's based on like Taiwanese education they think about the teacher has a responsibility to help them, the student so they have a responsibility they have to in charge or maybe I have to say they have to control uh, how their uh, students performance in class and how they're doing outside of class even outside of class they want to know now who what are the parents they are hanging out are these parents are their friends you know nice or not sometimes teachers they even trying to break you know go over the boundary and to to ask the student what you were doing yesterday what the, the student you're hanging out which was sounds very you know incredible surprising to Western st the, the student because the, normally that would be considered viewed as the privacy to the Western culture. But here, our, our elder generation, they are not aware of this question are considered as a privacy question to them. So they will just tend to ask them. And when you doubt them, you tell them it's not appropriate, the question to ask, they will question me again and say, well, I'm just showing my concern to the student. I'm trying to know what uh, they are doing in them because they are just a student. They don't know much about how how bad the world is. I have the responsibility to watch you know, over them and have taken of them. So that's basically what Taiwanese teacher will do here. And they will try to break through the confidentiality and the question you and ask you to have to report and then what's going on. So. Um, the hardest part to work in this counselor in Taiwan is you, I have to spend a lot of time explaining to what's the confusion to the teachers and also have to protect my client at the same time. That's the very hardest part to do that. And gossip also is very common. <laughs> I have to say, they're very common. I know that I know the gossip girl is very popular in <laughs> America, but in a gossip girl, it's very popular in Taiwan too. So here, gossip is very common, and teacher is very teacher is very you know because like I say, they don't have really basic concept of confidentiality, so they don't think they 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 don't have the standard of value to a word what what is supposed to tell to third party and what is not supposed to tell to third party. So they just talk about that when they, you know, when they, when the teacher usually they work in the same office, they have the break room. And sometimes they just naturally then talk about, well, there's one student had a problem in my class and so and so, and he is affect maybe this disease or maybe he has a family issue. They just, they just, you know, very naturally talk about this with their another teacher. So they know about this is consider the gossip but they just can they just can you know they just can uh, aware of this is not supposed to tell and at the same time gossiping also reflects the the teachers here they sometimes they are vulnerable they are not really confident about how to deal with the teacher the student cases they usually will consult with the peers a suggestion like their colleague the students so they will ask them about that so that also this behavior when God you know counsel with the peer that also reflect they want to maintain the society harmony because they don't know how to do that. They don't want to do something look like awkward decision to make. They want to the decision they are going to make they want to look like more you know, everybody would do. Everybody's agreement to do the solution. So that's why they like to talk. They like to talk. Then by talking to the peer, talk by talking to the teacher, so can be you know, can seeking, and maybe they consolidate like a better idea, better solution to, to deal with the student here. Yeah. So gossip is very, 
common in Taiwan, and keeping the privacy is really difficult in Taiwan. I have to, I'm sorry, I have to say that, but that's also the same time we are working on this in Taiwan. That's a, most of the helping professional in Taiwan, they are trying to work very hard at this you know, pace in Taiwan too. Finally, we had to deal with the matter of records retention. The trainee and supervisors were, all, were already seriously concerned about the privacy and security of the records at the various training sites during their training rotation. The matter became a great concern after the end of the training placement, particularly when there might be new students continuing on at the training sites. What was to become the records then? How do we ensure the security of the records? Where should the records be stored? In thinking through this problem, we had to concern ourselves with the matter of client privacy versus access to the records for the sake of the continuity of treatment. We had to think about corporate and personal responsibility. We had to think seriously about what is the proper standard of practice. For example, in the US, it is against professional practice to take records, client records home. We all are encouraged to finish up our uh, progress notes and records at the clinic and then return the records to the secure file location in the clinic. However, in Hong Kong, with the high likelihood that client records will not be secure after the student's training placement, we had to think seriously about the trainees taking the records home and storing them in a private home location where they will be safe from curious and prying eyes. Of course, when we followed this set of procedures, we sacrificed the continuity of treatment and burdened the trainees with the additional responsibility of assuring record of safety. Yet in the end, we figured that this was the lesser of two evils, considering the alternative of the likelihood of the client's records being broken into in the future. Well, this concludes our lecture of some of the challenges and opportunities one is likely to encounter when practicing psychology across international settings. I hope it has been an eye-opening experience and has challenged you to think more about the practice of psychology.